Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Stay Aware alumni lecture for this academic year. Understanding Major Depressive Disorder by Dr. Wael Salimi. Dr. Salimi is a clinical psychiatrist and adult psychotherapist. He is an instructor of psychiatry at the LAU Medical Center Hospital and at the Clemenceau Medical Center CMC. Dr. Salimi completed his MD degree in 2013 and clinical psychiatry in 2018, both from LAU's Gilbert and Rosemary Shahouli School of Medicine. He is a member of the European Psychiatric Association, EPA, since 2015, and the European Council of Neuropsychopharmacology, ECMP, since 2017. Thank you, Dr. Salimi. The floor is yours. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, is my voice loud enough? Yeah. Okay. So, we're going to be talking today about depression, um, a subject which either many people have experienced themselves or many people have at least come across in family members and relatives and friends. We're going to tackle depression from a different perspective today because over the past several years there have been changes in the understanding of depression and how to diagnose depression and how to treat depression and how to make sure somebody has responded to depression. So as a start in terms of the conflicts of interest, I have nothing related to this uh, subject. I will be tackling several key points, and then you will see this slide recurrently throughout the presentation, each time highlighting each topic that we're going to be covering. So the first aspect which we're going to be discussing is what is major depressive disorder and how do we define it? I want this to be interactive, so I'll be asking a lot of questions and I hope to hear from you. How do we define depression? What is depression? What are the major symptoms of depression? Yes. Okay, so lack of ambition, lack of appetite, loss of interest in life. Yes? No state of being. Excellent. So symptoms can be relative from one person to the other. They're not necessarily prototypic from one individual to the next. No self esteem. suicidal ideations in severe cases, yes? So we have a lot of symptoms, and we can start with one very simple example. Who would you classify as being depressed? We have a case of an elderly, retired male. He feels negative most of the time, though he's not suicidal. He thinks excessively. He worries a lot about the future or what remains in his life. He has no energy. He eats in excess, but without pleasure. He has insomnia. But yet he still tells you the basic things which he enjoys in life, which is playing poker with friends. He hasn't lost that interest. You have a second case, which is a middle-aged female. She claims that her mood is extremely normal. She doesn't feel depressed at all. She has excessive thinking as well. She's, recent, she's recently noticed that her smoking has been on the rise. She's been hyperactive. She fidgets a lot. She's restless. She has relatively good sleep. She has a good appetite. And she no longer enjoys sports, which is something that she used to enjoy as an activity. The final case we have is a 16-year-old boy. He denies being depressed, but he cries a lot. He no longer enjoys playing with his friends baseball or basketball. He has decreased academic performance. He's more aggressive at certain times. And he has good sleep and appetite. Who's depressed? The third, the 16-year-old. Who's depressed? No, no, the, the, first, the old guy, the old man. The first one, the old one. You feel all three. I think it's not easy to classify. You don't feel it's easy to classify? Because there are more than one factor uh, to classify. So there's more than one factor. It's a spectrum. Duration. Duration, excellent. I believe that it's very difficult to buy because most of the boys Related to someone that he has a psychological problem. Instead of the last one, the good sleep and appetite, the fact that the 
And she doesn't have a depression at all. And uh, the first one, which is the elder, is uh, taking this part of any uh, elder device. It doesn't uh, mean that they are depressed. So all the arguments are logical, all the arguments are rational. The correct answer is that we don't know. Depression changes. Depression, the definition of depression has changed over time. The understanding of depression has changed. Some people will talk about major criteria, some people will talk about minor criteria, some people will say that you have to have a specific duration. So when we do want to define depression in general, this is done based on something that is called diagnostic criteria. In psychiatry, every disorder has a diagnostic manual. And so when we talk about the diagnostic criteria, we will go through them a bit later. But before talking about that, it's important to understand what we think of depression today, what we know about depression, what is depression. And I go back to the slide before it. This still stands true. We don't know where depression comes from. We don't know what causes depression. We don't know if it's purely genetic, if it's purely environmental, if it's purely hereditary, if it's a combination of many things. In the end, you always have to keep in mind that psychiatry is the youngest discipline in medicine. Psychiatry has been around, real psychiatry has only been around for 60 years. So you cannot compare it to other disciplines that have been around for hundreds of years. Every day the, the definitions change. Every day the understanding of diseases and disorders change. We have several hypotheses. A lot of people have looked into different studies and different causes of depression. They refer to many different neurotransmitters. Sometimes the focus is on something called serotonin. Other times it's on something called norepinephrine. Other times it's basically related to stress and cortisol secretion in the body, which is a normal reaction. We see a lot of times in individuals that are depressed, very high levels of cortisol. So some people think that that is a cause of depression. And that's why we see depression in patients that have to take steroids as treatment a lot of times. Going on from what are the hypotheses, we can think about possible biological causes. Sometimes we see that depression progresses and it becomes more severe with age. So some people thought it's related to the fact that the brain doesn't have the ability to rejuvenate. The brain is the only organ in the body that if it is damaged or neurons are damaged, it cannot be recreated or replenished. But that theory is no longer valid because we now see that depression is starting at a much, much younger age. So if it was related to the loss of neurotransmitters in the brain, we wouldn't see depression starting in younger individuals. We also have ideas related to synaptogenesis, which is problems in the connection between neurons. So if we assume there's no brain damage, but we have a problem between the connectivity, that could be another theory. That was also considered no longer plausible because we have a lot of neurological disorders, such as multiple sclerosis, such as Parkinson, where we don't have depression. And we have certain other conditions where we have absolutely no problems in the connection of the brain, and yet we see depression. So again, we do not know what causes depression. All we know is that it is definitely multifactorial. We talk about the cognitive triad. It's related to seeing things negatively from three perspectives. You have negative views about the world, you have negative views about oneself, and negative views about the future. If any of these three are missing, most therapy theories related to psychotherapy from a psychological point of view, they do not believe that depression will develop. You need to have a negative view of yourself, you need to have a negative view of the future, and you need to have a negative view of the world. If any one of these is preserved, it's considered that you are a lower risk for developing depression because you're, you have a protective factor. If there are any questions, please feel free to, yes. Any questions? Yes. Uh, so depression is related to chemicals in our body. Yes. So a lot of theories now and evidence uh, based on spinal taps. We take fluid from the, from the brain through the spine. And we've noticed over consecutive and repeated examinations that when serotonin and norepinephrine are low, these are the two main hormones, neurotransmitters, that are involved in protecting us against depression. Which is why all medications that fight depression work through serotonin systems. So yes, there is a component that is related to a deficit in a hormone or a neurotransmitter in the brain. So if we take this, you're not sick. If you come back here. Yes. 
risks of We'll talk about the risks of taking antidepressants when we are not depressed. This is one slide we're going to talk about in the end. Any other? Yes. Excellent. So depression, yes, and you will see depression is definitely related, it's interrelated to different organs in the body. The first diagnostic criteria, and you'll see them on the slide in a bit, we have to eliminate organic causes. You have to make sure because hypothyroidism, if the thyroid is not working correctly, this is a major cause for depression. If a person has a certain tumor in the brain, it can cause compression of certain areas of the brain, and this can be a major cause of depression. When we talk about psychiatric depression or clinical depression, we are talking after we've eliminated all medical causes. So it's in the absence of any disturbance related to the normal function. In terms of the classification of depression, we'll talk about it. In terms of the classification, according to the DSM, which is the main guideline uh, for diagnosing psychiatric disorders, we have several disorders. We have the major depressive disorder, which is the most commonly known to individuals. We have the persistent depressive disorder, which is the most commonly missed diagnosis. This is very underdiagnosed, even though it is extremely prevalent. We have disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, substance or medication induced, certain medications such as steroids, as we said, can cause depression. And we have depressive disorder due to another medical condition. So somebody suffering from a chronic medical disease and there are consequences of that medical condition. What are the symptoms of depression? They're divided into the major and the minor criteria. Depression needs to, for a diagnosis of depression, symptoms need to be present for at least two weeks. They need to be present for the period, majority of that period, so in general 60% of the time during those two weeks. You need to have at least one of the two major criteria, which are listed on top, which are depressed mood and anhedonia, or loss of interest. If a person has all the secondary criteria, but denies depressed mood and denies anhedonia, he is not considered to be suffering from major depressive disorder. And we encounter this a lot. It is very important to understand, for a diagnosis to occur, you need to have diminished interest and or depressed mood, at least one of these. In addition to several of the secondary criteria, which include appetite disturbances, some people will eat more, other people will eat less. It's called an appetite disturbance. We have hypersomnia or insomnia. Some people will sleep more to escape from the problem, other people will spend excessive time worrying and thinking, and so they will have insomnia. There are psychomotor disturbances. You can either have people that become extremely restless and agitated. They cannot remain seated. You have other people that will tell you, when I wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm carrying a mountain on my shoulders. It becomes very difficult. Their movement becomes very slow. They have to drag themselves through all their activities throughout the day. There is a fatigue. There's a loss of interest. They no longer enjoy things. There's guilt and feelings of worthlessness. There's decreased concentration, which is a major criteria now. This is one of the most important things, and this is where I'm going to focus a little bit more, because newer theories in depression now focus on the importance of mental functioning and concentration. This is something that for a long time was ignored in depression. Finally, thoughts of death. So, to classify them, five or more of the nine symptoms, which we went through, these are the nine. We need to have, at least, they need to be present for two weeks, and they have to represent a change from the previous level of activity. If a person is continuously depressed, this is called persistent depressive disorder, and we will now compare them. So for a major depressive disorder, it has to be a change from their baseline level of activity. Symptoms are, they cause clinically significant impairment. So if a person tells you, I'm depressed, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating, I feel guilty, and I have black thoughts, but they're not suicidal, they function normally, they're going to work, it hasn't impaired their, their life at home as a family member, it hasn't impaired their education, it hasn't impaired their level of concentration, it hasn't impaired their sexual performance, it has not impaired anything, he is not or she is not depressed. There has to be a clinically significant impairment. The episode is not attributed to a physiological effect of a substance, so we've eliminated drugs or medications. Uh, they're not better explained by 
certain other mood disorders such as bipolar disorder or schizoaffective. And there has never been a manic episode, so it's, we'll talk about this is bipolar disorder. If a person has had a manic or a hypomanic episode, you can never classify them as having a major depressive episode. They have a depressive episode as part of the bipolar disorder. What's the difference between persistent depressive and major depressive? The duration, first of all. In major depressive, it's two weeks. In persistent depressive, it's two years. A person is persistently depressed for two years. In major depression, we have depressed mood and anhedonia. One of these symptoms, as we said, has to be present. And we discuss the remaining. In persistent depression, it has to be present for two years, and you need two or more of the criteria. So we don't have major or minor criteria anymore. That's the first major difference. The second major difference is we only need two or more criteria. That's why there has been a lot of criticism about if persistent depressive disorder is a logical uh, condition. Because a lot of people will be able to tell you that I've been eating excessively for two years and I have low energy for two years. Or many people will tell you I've been feeling guilty for two years and I haven't been sleeping. So there's a doubt regarding this, but clinically there is a lot of evidence that supports this as a diagnosis. What is functionality? This is maybe the most important part of today's lecture. What is functionality? What is the role of functionality? And how can we measure it? So, if I tell you what is functionality, what are some things that come to mind? Work. 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 Productivity. Productivity. Cognitive. Okay. Cognitive. Cognitive activity. Academic, Academic performance. Physical activity. Physical activity. So again, functionality is relative. Functionality refers to the quality of being useful, practical, and right for the purpose. It doesn't matter if you are ex excellent at concentration and analytical skills but your job requires you to do mechanical work. Functionality is how appropriately suited or how correctly do you meet the requirements of a specific function or a specific job or a specific role, whether you're a medical student, whether you're an instructor, whether you're a family uh, caregiver, whether you're a housewife, all of these are related to functionality. So when we talk about functionality, this is the newest classification for depression. <laughs> In the past, we used to classify depression in terms of response. Somebody responds to medication or they don't. Then they moved on to talking about remission. A majority of symptoms are no longer present. But then they realized it's no longer enough. If I have a medication and there's a depressed suicidal patient, if I'm able to give them a medication, remove their suicidal thoughts, get them to concentrate better, get them to enjoy a few things in life, and no longer want to hurt themselves, but sexually they are unable to perform with their partner. Uh, they're no longer enjoying going out with friends. Where is the functionality? That's why the definition of depression has changed. When we talk about response or remission, we now classify it based on functional recovery. So, in the 1970s, whether you responded to a medication or not was the only criteria. Did the medication work, yes or no? They did not care about how you feel today. If a medication caused weight gain, and it caused you to lose hair, but you're no longer suicidal, that meant that you're great and you're responsive. That's no longer the case today. They progressed to talk about remission. Some symptoms remain, but the majority have been eliminated. But then they realized that that's also not enough, because people were let off work because of poor concentration. People were getting divorced because of problems in their relationship with their partners. Then they came up with the concept of functionality. So full functional recovery is what we use as the classification. This was introduced in 2017, and it's about symptoms are essentially absent. You have removed all the symptoms, you've returned the patient to their normal level of functioning, and they are able to enjoy their life. So they're not worried about the weight they've gained. They're not worried about being sleepy all the time. It's about being able to function and to be productive. A bit of science, I'm not going to go into the details, but just so to understand how these theories have come about. The biggest study related to depression is called the STAR-D study. It's the Sequence Treatment Alternative Relief Depression, STAR-D, that's why it's called the STAR-D. 
one of the oldest medications most people will know is citalopram, and who is cipram, or the derivative of which came cipralex. When we talk about cipram and cipralex, the problem is in society we talk about doses that people know. If you look at the study, they went up to a dose of 40 milligrams in cipralex, which almost no psychiatrist ever gives. But this is how you actually test if people respond or not. It's not enough to say that I've given a patient a medication and I wait for a couple of weeks. You have to give it at the maximum effective dose for the correct amount of time to see if they are responders or non-responders. So in this study, they gave 2,876 patients, 80% of whom had chronic depression or recurrent episodes. They were initially treated with high dose of cipram, citalopram. Only 33% responded which means you had around uh, three-fourths of individuals that were, sorry, two-thirds of individuals that were non-responders. So they decided to add on a medication. We can either add to it something else or we can switch to another medication. Again, they found around the same concentrations, between 25% to 30%. So then they decided to add medications from different classes, mood stabilizers. And going back to the question about the thyroid, they added T3 for thyroid medication. Because a lot of studies now show that it is one of the strongest antidepressants. And now we use thyroid medications in patients that don't have hypothyroidism to treat depression. Because it shows that it works very well. And usually females like this because it causes weight loss. So they benefit from the side effect as well. So compliance, non-compliance was a major problem and it was mainly associated with high relapse rates and non-compliance was mainly due to the side effect of medications. Very simply to explain this, if you look at the first four columns ascending upwards, here we talk about this, uh, discontinuation of medications because of side effects. And each column refers to each attempt. So in the first group, it was the first time they had ever taken medications, 8.6% stopped medications because of side effects. They felt good, and they had improved, but they stopped because of the medication side effects. They switched to another medication. 23% stopped. And you continue until 41% of individuals will stop after three different medications or four different medications, even if the depressive symptoms have improved. And the reason is because patients and individuals care about the way they look, they care about their happiness, they care about living life. It's not just about removing a thought related to death, which is again related to the functionality. Yes? What side effects? We'll talk about them, but the main ones, weight gain, sedation, sexual dysfunction. These are the main three that were problems with patients. The other side refers to the problems of how people become resistant to medications. Every time you try a medication and you don't respond, it becomes harder to get improvement which is why we always tell patients, you have to start treating yourself at the soonest time possible. And there's always a fear related to psychiatric medications. I don't want to get stuck on these medications. I don't want to take an antidepressant because of what I've heard in society. But as you see, if you start in the beginning, and this is still a very low ratio, 27% improve. Only 27% respond. If they don't respond for the first time and they move on to a second one, you will only have 21% that respond the second time. A third medication, 16. Fourth attempt, less than 10% response. So treatment failure goes up, resistance to medications increases, and this is mainly because patients start treatment late, they stop medications before it is time. Patients will come to you and say, I came for depressed mood and suicidal thoughts, they're gone, so why should I take a medication for six months? We take it for six months because that's what guidelines say. And when you stop them early, you risk a relapse. This is just, again, to give you some statistics. In general, only 28% had remission, whereas 47% had response. And if you remember the definitions, response only means you improved. We don't care how you're doing, you just improved. Remission refers to you, the majority of symptoms have been eliminated. Yes? Talking here only about uh, medicines that will change the mood. What about the environment? We're going to talk about that. 
we will talk about psychotherapy and the environment and stress related to work and everything. The results don't have a relation with the environment. No, this study was done purely on individuals that they, excellent question. So the study eliminated all environmental factors. They took a group of individuals that were middle class, they did not face uh, familial problems, they did not face financial problems, they did not face any environmental issues. So those were eliminated as causes related to depression. Okay? In terms of treatment and discontinuation, as we said, patients will stop medications because of side effects. Our major problem in treating is side effects. This is an answer to why people stop their medicine. GI symptoms, some people get reflux, some people get bloating, some people suffer from constipation, other people from diarrhea. There's a lot of GI disturbances from the medication. 33% of individuals stop them for that. Weight changes, sometimes weight loss, sometimes weight gain, the majority being weight gain. Uh, decreased sexuality was the most important factor because this is one of the key or essential basic human instincts. When we talk about the human instincts in life, there are five, food, shelter, uh, water, security, and pleasure. Pleasure being sexual, pleasure one of them. So when they felt that this interfered with their ability to enjoy the sexual encounters with their partners, it was a major reason to stop medication. The final one was related to insomnia. How does depression affect work? Depression is a very costly disease. It costs time. It costs people to not go to work. It results in people being forced to go to work and being less productive, which has a very, very, very big financial cost on society as a whole. When we talk about remission, it's very important, as we said, to make sure that we talk about to what extent we are able to eliminate certain components or certain symptoms. And when we talked about functionality, as I told you, functionality was an in introduced as a topic because there was always a concern that we were treating the physical symptoms, treating the physical concern, treating the mood, but we were never paying attention to a person's ability to think. And a common side effect of older medications is that they cause something called blunting. He's very apathetic, indifferent to things. This used to cause problems with work. They would be able to sit and stare at papers and zero productivity. <coughs> Students that were depressed would take medications, they'd spend nine, 10 hours in the library and study as much as they should be studying in 10 or 20 minutes. So functionality is, is directly related to cognitive productivity. It's important, why is this important to us? It's important because if we look at cognitive symptoms during an episode and out of this episode, 94% of individuals will tell you that symptoms were present within an episode, okay? If you look at residual cognitive symptoms, so we treated the depression, the patient today is no longer depressed, almost 50% of subjects still complain of cognitive decline. And this was because of the side effect of medication. Because older medications caused slowing of thought processing slowing of comprehension, com uh, compromised memory, compromised retention of visual perception. So it's very important that this was, a, this was a landmark study that allowed pharmaceutical companies and the industry and the psychiatric community as a whole to think about newer medications. Yes. Uh, the term uh, symptoms is always uh, you know, coming through. So here you're talking about symptoms and also in the slide about definitions the latest definition that was, you know, read, it's about like the elimination of the symptoms yes. rather than the elimination of the root cause of the symptoms. Very true. So basically, when you eliminate the symptoms, it doesn't mean that the root causes will not uh, likely cause the symptoms to reappear. Exactly, because you haven't eliminated the baseline cause. Yeah. We're talking about elimination of symptoms. We haven't treated the cause of the depression. And to be able to treat the cause of depression, a major part is related to cognition. Because you need to be able, when your mood gets better, you should be able to look back at the depressive episode and understand why you got to where you are, why you became depressed. Was your reaction justified or was it an overreaction? These processes cannot occur if the medications are causing dulling of the brain. So it's very important that we are able to restore cognitive function in depression. 50, yes. When we talk about the older medications, 
Uh, when you stop the medication, they are reversible. Yes. All of the older medications, when you stop them, there is no permanent damage in terms of brain function from the medication. Zero percent probably. Yes. Even if you take them for five years? Even if you take them for 30 or 40 years. Uh, the longest period, the longest study looked into a cephalopramine, who is Cipralex. The average, uh, sorry, the longest period, they had 300 and some patients that were on the medication for 60 years. Normal memory, they have problems with dulling, they wouldn't concentrate very well, but if you do brain imaging, there is absolutely no damage in terms of damage. So the problems that they were facing are due to the side effects of medication and not due to damage from the medication. Are the side effects reversible? Yes, side effects are usually reversible. If we talk about sexual dysfunction, weight gain, uh, insomnia, hypersomnia, they are all reversible side effects. Once the medications are stopped, the side effects usually, they, they disappear after several weeks. Yes. So the question doesn't have to stop medication? Guidelines today say that we usually treat a major depressive episode for two years. If you get better after 30 days of medication, we always suggest if it's the first episode, we treat four to six months. After we stop the medication, we have what's called a two-year window period. If during two years the patient has another depressive episode, then we treat for two years. If the person goes two years without a depressive episode, and then he has another episode, we treat it four to six months every time. So the two-year cutoff is the main guideline for whether you need to be con uh, constantly on medications or not. 51% of people that work have taken time off because of a depressive episode. This is significant. It's significant on the economy. It's significant on the institution in which individuals work. It's significant on the individual because they lose income, which is already a major cause of depression in individuals. So depression is a very, very, very costly disorder. When we talk about functionality again, Guidelines will recommend that we divide treatment into two phases. The initiation phase, the maintenance phase. Up to the first 8 to 12 weeks is when the body is getting used to the medication and when the body is responding to the medication. So if a person has started treatment and he's been on a medication for two or three weeks, it's not enough to decide if he is getting better or not. You may want to increase the dose, you may want to decrease the dose because of side effects, but you cannot reach a consensus or a conclusion that the patient is not responding to the dose or to the medication. The maintenance period, if you look at the initial period, it's remission of symptoms. So again, even in the early stage, we no longer talk about response. We don't even consider response anymore. We talk about remission. So the first step is have majority of symptoms disappear. If the majority of symptoms have not disappeared within the first 8 to 12 weeks, then the medication is not working and you need to change the medication. If the majority of symptoms have been eliminated, then we go on to see, has their functioning improved? If it has improved, that means we are able to proceed into the maintenance phase, and then we talk about restoring complete functionality. If a person has remission, but they haven't reached functionality, that means we have to change the medication until we find the correct medication to get to functionality. The main guidelines today talk about functional improvement. No longer remission, no longer response. Another way of thinking about it is syndromal recovery. So as a patient, I will go to a psychiatrist. I have certain symptoms. This is what is called the syndrome. In the past, we used to talk about just the syndrome. You no longer meet the criteria. So if you remember the first slide I gave you, the diagnostic criteria of depression, if we talk about syndromal depression, if I no longer meet the criteria, then I cannot say that I am clinically depressed, but I may still be depressed in life because I haven't reached functional recovery. So it's no longer enough to talk about syndromal recovery. They moved on to talk about symptomatic recovery. So there's no longer has depressive symptoms, so he's generally in remission. So a person can be in remission, but they're still not functional. So we need to, again, take it one step further and talk about complete functional recovery. And this refers to going back to the pre 
illness stage, before the depressed episode. So, who is at risk of developing depression? Is it genetic? Is it environmental? Social? What is it? Yeah. Who's at risk? Everyone. Everyone is a general answer. Could work. Who else? Genetic. Let's, let's rephrase. Who is more likely to be depressed? Or who's at a higher risk? Depression can affect anybody from childhood up till death. Genetic. But genetic. So genetic. <laughs> Lebanese population. <laughs> Poverty. 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 Yeah, people from lower socioeconomic lower status. Challenged people. Challenged people. Yeah. Individuals that suffer from chronic diseases or illnesses. Could potentially be anyone. Yes. Regardless of their social class. Excellent. So it may not be related to social class. Isn't depression more recurrent for the people from the higher class of society? We will talk about it. It's actually the extremes. Lower socioeconomic and upper socioeconomic are at more risk. Middle class are always protected against depressive disorder. After? After a certain trauma, yes, that's a risk factor. Individuals with a certain handicap or disability, yes. Excellent. So disturbed familial or parental relationships. Bullying. Bullying. Okay, so individuals that are excessively religious or fanatics, that could be a risk factor as well. We will talk about all of these. 4.4% of the entire population in the world suffers from depression. The entire world. So if we take the group of individuals here, 4.4% of you would have experienced or may experience depression at a certain time during your life. This is how traumatic depression is. This is how important it is. This is how severe it is. And this is why, as of 2017, the World Health Organization has made mental health its number one concern in terms of long-term goals. Because depression is on the rise, suicide is on the rise, self-injury is on the rise, all mental health disorders are on the rise. And this is because for a lot of time, for a long time, they've been ignored. We're going to talk about it. Okay, yes. Yes. It doesn't apply here. It's a completely different thing. It's very different. If you're talking about bipolarity, the first thing is you have to see how many depressive versus manic episodes. And then depends on if there are more manic or more depressive episodes, each one has its own guidance. So it's very different. It's much more complicated than bipolarity. So if you look at, in general, we have increased pre prevalence amongst females, slightly more. 5.1% of all females compared to 34 of all males. It occurs in all age groups, but the majority is uh, in females 55 to 74. If we look at where we are, the Eastern Mediterranean, we are at 9% of the population. So we are actually higher than the entire global population. We are almost two times the amount of where we should be. Uh, uh, yes. 16, 16. 16. Oh, sorry, 16. So we are much higher, okay? We're at 16%. If we go even further into this, yes. Are depressed people Excellent. Only 30 to 40% of individuals that have depression know they are depressed. And that's one of the major reasons that depression is not treated, because people are not aware of the symptoms. They don't know that they need treatment. Are depressed people dangerous? Are depressed people dangerous? In what sense? No. Usually depressed individuals are, have a tendency towards self-injury more than other individuals. Um, yes. I have a question. Those, like the statistics you use, so only for people who have actually gone and seeked help? These are based on, yes, these are based on national registries. Yeah. So it's only individuals that have been treated or individuals that are in international databases. So you have a huge proportion of individuals that we don't even know about. Yeah. And that's always a major challenge in statistics. Okay. So if we go again, just how the division or the distribution is around the world, 2%, as you go across the line, 
the darker the countries get, that's the percentage you have in terms of major depression. The slide that was before at 16% is how many people meet criteria for depressive disorders. So it can be depressive disorder major or persistent depressive disorder. When we talk about major depressive disorder, Lebanon is at around 5.5%, which is almost equivalent to the international statistics. We are slightly a bit higher than the international statistics. This is another way of looking at it. If you look at the Eastern Mediterranean, and I will give you a slide on Lebanon specifically, so we're at around here, if you compare to the international world, the line in the Mediterranean is slightly above international statistics. So we are at an alarmingly rate, we are increasing at an alarming rate, because this is the 2017 statistics. The 2013 statistics were 0.6% lower. And 0.6% when you're talking about 322 billion individuals is a very big number. So it is a major issue. If we look at the, pre the prevalence in terms of age, you can see that depression can affect everybody. Females, the dark blue, are always at a higher risk. Why? Why? We're going to talk. <laughs> if we look at Lebanon again, so this is the distribution of Lebanon. This is, again, about what you were saying. The number of cases reported were 255,000. These are the ones that sought attention. So these are the ones that actually went to psychiatrists, and they are on the National Database Registry. In, no, this is the cumulative. In People that haven't died yet, people that haven't uh, lost their lives, people that are diagnosed and they are present on treatment. Okay? It compares anxiety and depression. If you look at the depressive disorders, we're talking about 4.7%, okay? So we are around, again, the global number. In Qatar? Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and uh, Greenland and the... the because they have no concerns. That's what you remember about when you talk about countries where you are financially secured and people feel generally more comfortable, it's not always a protective factor. Can you please go back to that one? Can you talk about it? Yes. So the darker countries indicate a higher rate of depression. Okay? And as you can see, countries with a high rate of depression are the United States, including Alaska. Greenland, Iran, Australia. It's usually places, here there are several factors. First of all, the environment and the weather. Alaska. Weather and Australia. Well, I was thinking Australia is pretty warm and nice. Don't forget that the climate changes due to where it is located on the globe is not entirely uh, adjusted correctly. The closer you get to the equator, the more normal summer occurs when it's supposed to, according to the rest of the world. The farther you go up or the farther you go down, winter and summer interchange. And that itself can cause depression because of fluctuations in the secretion of melatonin and other hormones in the brain. Okay? So this is this is mainly why we see these trends. Excellent. That's another factor. Maybe raising so much awareness has more people seeking attention. And that's why we have more information on our databases. This is not adjusted for that. They are adjusted, but it's adjusted for how much people have sought attention. Again, I think, in my opinion, the Lebanese statistics are far below what they actually are. You can take it from clinical experience and clinical practice. We see depression much more than 4.7% of the actual population. So it's a much bigger issue than what it's actually represented. What's important to us at the moment is that most depression has been stable except in younger individuals. Younger university students and school students have the highest rate of increase in depressive disorder. If you look at the scales in general, individuals that are aged above 50 have been relatively stable from 2009 to 2017. The same applies for individuals from 26 to 49. The major increase has been in individuals from 12 up to 28. And this is a very alarming increase in terms of numbers. 
and we see the exact same increase in terms of suicidality. Suicide is on the rise. The biggest proportion of individuals at risk of suicide are individuals in their 15s up to the late 20s. This is where most cases of suicidal attempt or successful suicide unfortunately occurs. When we talk about suicide, we have one death every 40 seconds. So during this lecture, we've already had, or by the end of this lecture, you will have already had around 387 individuals that have died because of suicide. This is global. This is how significant depression has become. This is how alarming it is. Yes? Yes, food and diet, uh, dietary modification does play an important role in this. We also talk about the fact that 75% of suicides occur in lower socioeconomic, so middle to lower socioeconomic status. And if you talk about it, 57% of the entire population, so if you take it, there are more deaths due to suicide, 50%, than the deaths that are secondary to war and homicide together. So if you combine wars across the world, in addition to homicides and terrorist attacks, it accounts for less deaths than people that are taking their own lives. Why isn't that with younger uh, generations? Because of bullying, because of bullying, because of peer pressure, because of the need of having to fit in to certain expectations and cultural norms in society, because of the increased pressures, because the fact that parents are so saturated and overwhelmed by their own problems that they show it to their kids. And kids are much more susceptible to these kind of emotional stressors. So when parents express their concern and their worry about finances and how they're able to be, how they're going to be able to pay tuition and how they're able, if they're going to be able to get medical insurance and if they're able to get medications, kids think about this. Children think in their unconscious a lot. And this is a very big risk factor for depression. One important concept to know is something in medicine referred to as the DALI. It's the days adjusted, so it's the disability adjusted life years. So when we talk about the healthy individual, then we talk about the disease or the disability a person gets. So person A is healthy until let's say the age 23 when he's diagnosed with depression. From that point on, it's the years lived with disability up till the time they die. When we talk about DALI, it is the difference in the life expectancy compared to a normal individual. And the average daily is 11 years, which means that people with depression are likely to die 11 years younger than they are expected for their age group because of suicide, because of uh, uh, problems related to medications, which can cause obesity, because of uh, problems related to complications, such as becoming a cardiac patient, uh, because of the stress, there's a lot of factors. So it's very important to understand that the person that is left untreated with depression is expected to have a life that is 11 years shorter than people of the same age, which is why we need to treat depression. This is just all of the diseases on earth and their severity. This is depression. This is where it is. If you look at cancer, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, for example, is so, what you hear uterine cancer, vitamin A deficiency, chicken pox, ovarian cancer, kidney cancer, gallbladder cancer. All of the cancers are much less deadly than what depression can cause. That's how severe depression is. This is another way of looking at it. It's very difficult to understand, but all you need to know is this color is associated with mental health. And this has significantly increased. What they do in each of the columns is they compare. So this is the age group, 20 to 24, for example. The first column is how many people we had in 1990. The second column is how many individuals we had in 2016. We had this many compared to this many. And you will see that they, are, they have been rising in every single one of the columns. Depression has been on the rise in all age groups, which is why, as you said, it can affect anybody from any age. Yes, which is also a problem because people are living longer and so they're at a higher risk of developing depression, that's for sure. So how does this fit into why do we care about depression? Depression is the number one 
largest contribution to fatal deaths. It causes 7.5% of all deaths. 7.5% of all deaths. These are just statistics we've gone through. So, according to the World Health Organization, it is the leading cause of disability, and it is the second cause, only preceded by heart disease, to global burden of disease. So heart disease is number one, depression is number two. The first question I asked, what causes depression? Is it environmental, is it genetic, or is it social? The right answer is everything. When we talk about environmental, climate is a major risk factor, and that's why we have something called seasonal affective disorder. People get depressed in autumn, people get depressed at the end of spring. It's because of the change in weather. It is called seasonal affective disorder. Climate and sun exposure, which is why a lot of studies now say that the higher concentration of vitamin D you have, the more protected you are against depression. Which is why, in addition to using thyroid medications, we now encourage all patients to take vitamin D supplements even if they are not deficient in vitamin D. Dietary intake, dietary changes, toxins in the food, the productivity and the storage and the preservatives that is present in food plays a major role. Farm food. Farm food. Genetics, depression runs in families. Twins are always at the higher risk of developing depression if one has depression. Depression during pregnancy increases the risk of the baby developing depression, which is why you have to treat depression during pregnancy and postpartum depression. Because during the postpartum phase, the baby is usually breastfeeding from the mother. And the disturbances in the hormones will also predispose the baby because that is where they get their immunity. Finally, in terms of social, which is the biggest factor today in today's society, poor social support systems, people don't have time to help one another, people are too preoccupied with their own, in fact, uh, their own issues, workplace-related stressors, at work you have increased demands, decreased input, you're getting paid less and expected to do more. And this is a major problem because people feel demotivated to work. You have the issues related to perfectionism, so people with OCD have a very high risk of developing depression. You have social isolation, being socially outcasted, belonging to a social minority. This is a big problem. And bullying. So who is at risk? Everybody is at risk, yes. But when we talk, yes? Isn't social media one of the Social media is a very big factor related to it, and it falls into the bullying aspect. Because it, 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 social media has encouraged people to become bullies. Because it's easy now to make fun of people and to bully people anonymously. It's very difficult most of the time for people to, to humiliate or to bully somebody face to face. But via the virtual world, it's much easier. And this has caused a lot more cyber victimization. So people that have been victims to cyber bullying. And this increases depression. Especially for the young generation. Yes. And that's why we see a lot of increased depression and suicidality in the younger generation. For pregnant women, when they have a child, they go into the Post yeah, baby blues. Baby blues. Yes. It's the it it Yes. It affects the child. We give medications that are safe for the mother and the baby. You have to treat it. Doesn't perfectionism on the social media platforms affect the younger generation with the Yes, this is what we were talking about. The perfectionism and the, the, the need to conform an ideal and to, uh, to fit into a certain ideal or expectation in social media makes people under a lot, puts people under a lot of pressure. And this can predispose to depression, the key. So, yes, it's becoming difficult to meet or, meet or almost impossible. So when we talk about who's at risk, everybody is at risk. But who are the major groups? These are the people you always need to keep an eye out for. Elderly patients, because most of the time they don't have a good social support system. They've raised their kids, they've been left alone at home, their partner has either passed away, their kids have left the country, so they don't have good social support. We talk about youth because of bullying, because of the internet, because of media, because of higher expectations in society. We talk about ethnic minorities, and ethnic minorities, it's very important. You are an ethnic minority when you are in another country. Everybody is potentially an ethnic minority. 
please get it out of your head that an ethnic minority refers to a specific group of individuals coming from a specific continent or a specific area. I am an ethnic minority if I go to Africa. I am an ethnic minority if I go to the United States of America. We are all considered ethnic minorities when we are outside of our natural setting. That's right. Yes. Uh, people suffering from chronic diseases, osteoporosis, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, cancer, any chronic disease can predispose to depression. And the final one are sexual minorities. This is a very big group. This is a very, uh, this is a group that's at a very big risk because they are social outcasts. Most of the time they are not accepted by society. They have to live their lives behind closed doors. They have to live a double life. And that's where you see a huge amount of suicide as well in the younger population. <coughs> so, how do we treat depression? I'm almost done. Um, in general, medications and psychotherapy. It's a combination of both. There is no single medication that will cure depression. Psychotherapy alone in the presence of suicide and extreme negativity cannot eliminate these thoughts. Psy in general, psychiatrists like to go for medications, but that is not the correct treatment. The correct treatment is a combination of psychotherapy and medication. The only time that you start with medications is when a patient is so severely depressed that they cannot respond to the psychotherapy. So you have to start with the medications to improve the mood slightly so that they can be receptive to the psychotherapy. But never, never, never assume that if you take a medication and do not do psychotherapy, that once you stop the medications, you will not relapse. You're always at a risk because the causes of depression have not been treated. You've only been treating the symptoms with the medications. <coughs> so, how do we measure treatment efficacy? First of all, we need to get the global burden of the disease down. It's currently on the rise, so we're not doing enough to treat depression. That's one major issue. The inefficacy of uh, existing antidepressants, they're not doing enough. Again. Suicide is on the rise. If the medications were working enough, we'd see suicide decreasing in all age groups. And finally, low remission and or response rates. We are not satisfied with the outcomes. What is the ideal treatment? The ideal treatment is something that is weight neutral. There's low withdrawal rate. So once you stop the medication, you're not going to relapse. It doesn't cause any sexual dysfunction. It doesn't cause sleep disturbances. It's mild to moderate transient GI symptoms, gastric symptoms such as nausea or bloating. There is a low rate of safety related problems, so you can mix it with other medications because as we said, one major group at risk are people with chronic diseases. So you need to make sure that you're, if you're giving a medication for the depression, you're not disturbing or uh, worsening another medical condition. Low rate of treatment uh, emergent adverse reactions, so we want to minimize the negative consequences of treatment. And uh, finally, the low potential for drug-drug interactions, again. So, one medication for all? No. We don't have an ideal medication. Up till today, we do not have one medication that can treat every single thing. But we do have certain medications where we do take advantage of certain side effects. So for a patient that is depressed and has a problem related to eating and sleep, they're not sleeping enough and they're not eating, I would want a medication that causes weight gain and that causes sedation. So side effects are not always bad. Side effects are bad based on what the patient needs and what the patient wants. And that's how you need to select your medication. You as individuals, if you ever are in need of a psychiatrist, you need to be the decision maker, not the psychiatrist himself. They will talk about what books have taught them. You are the individuals living with the experience. So you need to tell them what you want out of life. You need to tell them what you want to experience tomorrow and the day after and the day after. Treatment is only considered successful if you are the decision maker. So again, who would we classify as depressed? Everybody. Finally, take home messages. Existing uh, antidepressants obviously are not doing enough. We need to create newer medications. Psychotherapy has to take a bigger role. We need to include psychotherapy in earlier stages of treatment. Depression is a complex process. There are many hypotheses. We don't have a clear understanding of why it occurs. The treatment of depression uh, has shifted from response to remission to full functional recovery. 
that should always be your end goal. So whether you are depressed or you know somebody that is depressed, spend some time trying to assess if they have re recovered completely and if they have returned to their full functional recovery. If not, then they are not being treated correctly. Functional recovery is the ability, as we said, to return to a pre-morbid state before the disease came about. We need to achieve remission. This is a major challenge. And about 25% of, of patients will stop medications because of the adverse drug reactions. So pick the medications wisely. Don't blame the doctor if the medication causes a side effect if you didn't initially tell the doctor that you have a problem with weight gain or weight loss or hypersomnia or insomnia. He cannot read your mind. You need to tell the doctor, I want to get better, but I don't want A, B, C, D. You have to be the decision maker. Any questions? <laughs> Did I go over time? <laughs> Why we shouldn't take okay, so why should we not take antidepressants if we are not depressed? Um, the problem is that individuals that are not depressed, there's always a risk that the antidepressant will push you too far up. And when you go too far up, it increases impulsivity, it, it increases irrational decision making. So you may end up doing or acting or behaving in certain ways that you will not be very happy at certain times. So there is a risk to taking antidepressants when you are not depressed. In addition? To the side effects, yes. One thing you know, it discusses, uh, like from a monetary perspective, like going to see a psychologist, and even as a start, is so expensive, especially in this region. Yes. Uh, seeking mental health care is a very big problem because of the costs. Psychotherapy is expensive. Psychiatrists generally are expensive as well. Um, it's not covered by insurance in Lebanon, which is a major problem. And in most of the advanced world, whether you're talking about Europe or the United States, psychiatrists, if you compare, if you go on Google and you compare the average rates, a psychiatrist in the United States, does anybody know how much they charge per session? Over 283 is the average. But because the patient pays 10% of it, third party payers, whether insurance or Medicare, pay the less, the rest. So when a psychiatrist charges $280, the patient is paying $28. The rest is being paid by the insurance. But that doesn't apply in Lebanon, yeah, which is a very big problem. This is why a lot of people don't seek medical attention, because they cannot afford it. The average psychiatrist in Lebanon can go anywhere from $50,000 up to $300. Very, very out no, in certain outreach areas. If you're talking in dispensaries or places that are very impoverished, in certain areas of Lebanon where you have underprivileged societies, there are psychiatrists that take them. Yes. Okay, so can antidepressants increase the risk of bone fracture or affect bone density? The general consensus about this, which is important, especially in menopausal or postmenopausal women, is that no. Up till today, all antidepressants have passed all the tests in terms of increasing the risk of osteoporosis or fractures related to bone or even decreased bone mineral density. Yes, all medications on the market have almost zero effect on bone density. Yes. Why are the women more depressed? Because they, usually they cause depression. <laughs> so in general, what? Yes. On, on, on that point, that was another thing I was thinking with the stats you provided, is women are, uh, are a lot more accepting and are, are a lot more okay with being vulnerable, so they will seek help a lot exactly. more than men. Which is why it's a higher percentage. Men just seek aggression. Um, and don't go actually see help. That's I one reason, that's, that's actually one, re one reason why women are rated as having a higher percentage. Because women, so the discussion was, is why are women at a higher risk of depression? And we need to rephrase the question. It's not that they're only at a higher risk. Women are partially at a higher risk, but women also are more willing to accept their vulnerabilities and go seek medical attention. So if you take a general uh, analysis of any psychiatric clinic, you will find 70 to 75, if not more, percent of the patients are female. And that's why we have more studies and more numbers on females. 
So part of that increase is because women are more willing to accept they have a problem because they don't have the narcissistic tendency that most males do. They're able to accept the fact that I'm vulnerable. They're able to accept the fact that I'm facing an issue and they don't seek medical attention. The other part is that yes, they are at an increased risk, but that risk, if you looked at the slide with the different age groups, the risk difference in age di disappears after menopause. The reason that women are at a higher risk premenopausally is because of the hormonal changes that occur during menstruation. Estrogen, testosterone, progesterone play a very important role in emotional disturbance and emotional regulation. So as long as a female is premenopausal, she will be at a higher risk of depression. Once we get to the postmenopausal phase, men and women almost have the same percentage or the same risk of developing depression. Uh, do like uh, antidepressants cause dementia? Do antidepressants cause dementia? Do antidepressants cause dementia? No, antidepressants do not cause dementia. Older antidepressants cause, cause slower cognitive perception. They cause problems related to memory. They cause problems related to concentration. But once the medication is stopped, these side effects reverse after several months. But there is no link between them causing dementia. Yes. Uh, do you think that living without goals can cause uh, depression, yet at the same time having high goals can also uh, have depression? Okay, so for, first question is having goals, can having high goals lead to depression because of disappointment or over expectation or over ambition? And can not having goals also lead to depression because a person feels demotivated? The answer to both is yes. You have to set rational goals, you have to set logical goals, given the environment, given your individual abilities, given the circumstance of the country, given the circumstance of what is available to you and the available resources. At the same time, if you don't set goals, then you become indifferent to life and indifferent to the world. So both are a risk factor for depression. Uh, what uh, do you think about uh, spiritual treatment? There's studies about Excellent. So spirituality uh, as a treatment for depression. There is a lot of evidence now in favor of spirituality, in favor of energy healing, in favor of um, what we consider collaborative, uh, collaborative treatments. My personal opinion is that they will never replace psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy, but they definitely have an added advantage. They definitely can reduce the duration of treatment. They definitely can reduce the doses required. They definitely can reduce the severity of the depression. <laughs> okay, so if there's a genetic risk for depression, do drugs have to be taken for life? The answer is no. We treat it as we said. If it's the first episode, four to six months, if after four to six months the individual does not have any depression, we consider we're back to square zero. Any episode he has after that in two years, then we treat again four to six months. If they have a depressive episode within two years after stopping the medication, then we treat for longer. Okay? Any other? Yes? I wanted to ask, does anxiety cause depression? Excellent. Does anxiety cause depression? 66% of individuals with depression, uh, sorry, 66% of individuals with anxiety will develop depression, and 45% of individuals with depression will develop anxiety. They are very interrelated. Does the work environment affect a person that isn't, uh, uh, well, didn't have any cases of depression before, depression? So can the work environment put a person at risk of developing depression if they've never had a depression before, or if they've never had any risk factors for depression? Yes, social environment and the social environmental structure is very important. Work stressors is a very, very, very big risk factor for developing depression. Yes. Usually anxiety, anxiety, OCD, and depression, they're treated with the same medication. So when you usually give a medication for the OCD, if there is an underlying depression, it should be treated. It will go with the medication. 
then again, we have a higher risk of relapse, we have a lower response rate, which is why you need to really spend a lot of time initially with the patient, deciding what is the right medication, what's right for his or her condition, and what's right based on what their concerns are. So a student in university, they will tell you, I don't want a medication that's going to cause me to be sleepy all day or that may decrease my concentration. I don't mind gaining one or two kilos, but I need my concentration. Then that will take you in a certain direction in terms of how to treat as well. So it's collaborative between the patient and the psychiatrist. Responsibility to go to the doctor, or does the doctor need to follow up with the patient? I think it's a balance of both. It's not one or the other. In general, when you meet with a patient, you should inform them of when they are supposed to follow up. That's the first thing. If the patient does not present for a follow up, usually the psychiatrist should get in touch with the patient, either directly or via sending a SMS reminder or anything of the sort. There are certain programs now which are available, which we use a lot. I mean, I tell the patient that you're going to receive a reminder because I need to see you because we're adjusting medications. I need to see you in four weeks. Once we stabilize, I tell them I need to see you in three months. So there are applications where you can just put the reminder and then the application automatically will send the patient an email or a message. And then you as a psychiatrist can see if you receive it. If he doesn't receive it, all it takes is a phone call to check. I sent you a reminder and you need to come to a follow-up. The problem is, again, that some people will tell you this is my personal decision. And you as a psychiatrist, you don't have the right to force me to come. Which is where there's a very thin line. Which is why you need to be careful in how far the psychiatrist can go with the patient. Yes? Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, is very unethical. It's very unethical to tell a patient you, know, you have an appointment at 9 o'clock, you didn't come, the shabrashta alayk, next time you come you have to pay, pay for two appointments. This is very unethical. Let's start with that. So this should never happen. And this is something that if it's ever happened to anybody, this should be reported. Because this is a reportable incident. So in general, you should never do that. Some people, like you said, maybe if you tell the patient that I'm going to charge you, it will force them to come. But I will take the counter argument. If you're forced to go to psychotherapy, psychotherapy is going to have zero effect. You can never force somebody to get treated or to want to improve. They have to go to the psychotherapist because they want to go to the therapist. Yes. Depression is more common amongst the Lebanese statistics. Yeah. So the Lebanese statistics, the last ones were in 2016. Girls that are, are at a higher risk of depression. Boys are at a higher risk of anxiety. Girls are at a higher risk of um, OCD and anorexia. Boys are at a higher risk of self-injury, burning themselves with cigarettes. Boys are at a higher risk of trichotillomania, hair pulling. Um, Substances, boys are at a higher risk, but not very, not a very big difference. Yes. Excellent. So any time above the age of six, you can start treating. Yes, most medications are FDA approved for six. No, no, I'm in 
I'm telling you to start. Actually, we want to say if you can treat. We talk about whether it's safe or not, whether we need a medication or not. If a patient comes to me and he's five years old and he needs treatment, but I cannot treat him because the medications are not allowed, then there's nothing that can be done. So in general, we talk about treatment starting at the age of six because first of all, they will be able to comprehend psychotherapy and they will be able to respond to the medications because they're safe. And in certain situations like domestic violence, sexual abuse that occurs younger, at the, younger than the age of six, psychotherapy can help. You can do psychotherapy at a younger age. And, um, how do you assess the schools? Uh, because of the kind of the longer and longer that kind of follow up whether you're asking me my opinion or Adam Shepard. So how do I assess or what's my opinion of the psychotherapy systems in schools in London? Uh -huh. <laughs> Are patients coming? Do they come? Tell us about it. Tell us, tell us about it. It's interesting. We have a lot, especially because of teenagers and the training of body electrons in the media and the peer pressure and the hormonal changes. So we do have a lot. And to bring this into But was it you that started into as a psychotherapy? Did you raise awareness? Yes. So that's what I mean. This is my point. This is the problem. When we talk about public schooling and most private schooling, you are one of the exceptions because you took the initiative of mental health. Mental health is still on a rough on most schools in Lebanon. They don't take it. Yeah, yeah. Even a lot of private schools aren't doing what you're doing, which is why I'm saying you're the exception. I hope it has a ripple effect and it goes on to the rest of the schools in Lebanon because we get a lot of children that have either not gone to the psychotherapist or they unfortunately have very bad experiences with the psychotherapist at school. More a kid in public schooling than in private schooling, but it does occur in private schooling as well. Yes. May I suggest that perhaps in the case of the young lady over there, perhaps a family member can coordinate with the psychiatrist or the psychologist or the uh, you know what I mean? You call you call the psychiatrist on what give my dad a call, like have him come over. Or maybe have, no seriously, or or tell your dad that like, perhaps you know play the role, start to talk to you might get some help. More than I think. No, you don't. So it's a myth. If a patient is stable on a medication, do we have to increase the dose? No. If the patient requires an increase in the dose, it's not because of resistance or dependence or because he accommodated. It's because maybe the medication caused weight gain. So the amount is no longer at the right concentration for his weight. It has to be adjusted. Yes. Um, what would make a boy a teenager and hurt himself, slash his wrists? Bullying. Bullying. But why would you, I mean, a town getting bullied? I'm 16 year old boy, I'm a squad getting bullied. Why, why, what's going to make me want to cut my, my wrists and burn myself? With there are certain underlying personalities. Borderline personality is a risk factor. There are some people, because of poor social support, the absence of a mother or father during childhood, uh, over demanding parents that want the, the child to be a perfectionist. These are all risk factors for self-injury for your child. Yes? What is the role of subconscious mind? Uh, in, in what sense? In, in treating the depression. Excellent. So what's the role of the subconscious in treating depression? The role of the subconscious in treating depression is very big. But for you to be able to access the unconscious, as I said, if a patient is severely depressed or suicidal, they are not able to reach the subconscious, and they're not able to act on. Yes, that's why, because uh, our function, functioning is related to 95%. Uh, exactly, yeah, which so is why we start the medications to improve the cognitive functioning, to stabilize the brain, yeah. so that then we can access the unconscious. How you can access? This through psychotherapy. Huh. D during uh, discussion? Yes, of course, the... through psychotherapy. You need to do psychotherapy, sometimes psychoanalysis, Sometimes EMDR, sometimes cognitive behavioral, sometimes dialectical behavioral. There are many different approaches. Yeah, but normally uh, you cannot access it like uh, in the normal uh, no. situation. 
Uh, you have to, to have uh, the Theta wave. I don't know. I'm, 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 so, I'm reading a little bit of, uh, of this topic. So this is related to the hypnosis? Yeah, exactly. No. You don't always have to hypnotize a patient to be able, or you don't have to hypnotize a patient in the traditional way to be able to access the unconscious. When you do yoga and a person tells you to disconnect from your surroundings, this is a kind of hypnosis. But it's not related to having an amethyst rock on a, on a string going back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Hypnosis is related to taking the mind from a state of consciousness and blurring the limit between the conscious and unconscious. And you can do that. You don't necessarily have to hypnotize a patient in, a, in the traditional way. So you can access the unconscious. Okay. Yes? What are the side effects for a long treatment with antidepressants without any adjustments for almost 15 years? It depends on the medication. If it causes weight gain, I done increasing weight. If it causes sexual dysfunction, persistent sexual dysfunction. If it causes insomnia, he's going to have chronic insomnia. It will maintain a person. They will stay stable. Is it possible that a person is aware that he has depression? Is it possible to overcome this issue without having to be present? In some cases, yes. In some cases, you can overcome depression when it's mild. When we're not talking about a major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder, you are going to need treatment, whether psychotherapy alone, medications, and psychotherapy. Thus, you need treatment. If it's a mild depressive episode, it can be treated uh, on its own. Yes? Um, so, raising awareness is, I don't think, enough, especially when the audience is actually interested in the topic. So, basically, we're not raising awareness to more people who are not aware of it. Uh, is there any solution that you can propose or think of? Is the syndicate of physiotherapists pushing an uh, insurance company to include um, uh, therapy in their, in their package? Is there any kind of materialistic... There's a lot of efforts that have been made over the last couple of years. Some insurance companies now in Lebanon, we have three insurance companies that now do cover mental health. So the private insurance companies, there are now three in Lebanon that do cover mental health, obviously at an increased expense, but uh, they do cover mental health. Yeah, but they're not. Yes. Which, which ones? Which one? Uh, MedGolf, Fidelity, and there's one more. Which I Sometimes a psychiatrist can be a psychotherapist if he has had training as a psychotherapist. Not every psychiatrist can be a psychotherapist. Yes, you have psychotherapists alone, Akib. Can stress and depression cause heart disease? The answer is yes, because persistent stress will increase cortisol levels. And persistent cortisol levels will increase the risk of depositing fat on the vessels. And this will lead to cardiac and ischemic disease. So yes, depression can, yes, it can be a direct cause. Are there more Can you repeat the question? Yes, any individual that has a disability as a child is definitely at an increased risk if they are not followed up from the beginning and educated. They, they haven't received psychoeducation on how to deal with their, with their, with their disability. Yes? Can someone be able to still be depressed? Yes, that's the persistent depressive disorder. They can be receiving medications as at the doses or the medications that are for major depressive disorder. So they've been misdiagnosed as major depressive and treated for major depressive, and that's why they're not improving, because they actually have persistent depressive disorder. And in such cases, you would think of the alternative medications, such as the thyroid medications, such as vitamin D, such as uh, those kind of supplements. Yes? For genetic uh, depression, does it have to go through every generation? No. It can skip generations. What if nothing works? For example, the patient tries different medications, different therapists, and nothing actually works. It's impossible for nothing to work. It's either the medications that have been taken are not the correct medications, and now we have genetic testing. And it, most patients now will present to the clinic before we give a medication, we do genetic testing. We take a swab from the throat, we send them uh, either to Europe or to the States. The results come back and they tell you which medications you respond to or which medications you don't respond to. 
and they can tell you this is a good medication for you, but the side effects are going to be very strong, or this is an excellent medication with zero side effects. So we are able to do this now. The problem is that it is a little bit costly. Most of the genetic testing will cost anywhere from 500 to 800 dollars. But this covers depression, cancer, uh, which depression, all anxiety, uh, sorry, all psychiatry medications, all neurological medications, all antibiotics, um, all cancer medications. So this is done once. This is done once. This is done once in your life. Okay. Yes. Regarding the thyroid treatment, which is worse, having depression or having hyperthyroidism? Having hyperthyroidism can cause anxiety. Having hypothyroidism can cause depression. Because you're stimulating the thyroid generally. Okay, excellent question. So usually when you're giving, we're not giving uh, FT4, we're giving FT3. FT4 is the one that causes hyperthyroidism symptoms. FT3 doesn't cause symptoms. Because FT3 leads to FT4. In certain amounts. Because when you're giving it, you're not giving, you have different kinds of medication. When you're giving a dose, you're not going to give a therapeutic dose of 100 or 150 micrograms. You're going to give 25 micrograms per day. The dose is too low for the conversion of FT3 to FT4. So it will not cause hyperactivity of the thyroid. Same question, Toxicity. You're afraid of toxicity, which is why we always want a patient within the upper limit of more mish and toxic level. Yes. Does the question have to be depression or is it only mental disease? In what sense? Yes. Akeem. These are called somatizations. You see, feet touch seed and I want. People can feel back pain, people can feel chest tightness, people can feel sensitivity in their hands, tingling, uh, difficulty breathing. They feel like when I take a breath, my lungs don't open completely. These can be from depression, but they are more commonly from anxiety. Yes. Yes. Can depression affect memory? Yes, Akib. Depression can impact memory negatively, definitely. About the physical symptoms, um, when you treat the anxiety, you disappear after? Yes. When you treat the anxiety, the symptoms disappear. Yes. Anxiolytics or antidepressants? Usually antidepressants, yes. Yes. Without the anxiety. Because antidepressants work on anxiety. No, this is a miss. This is a myth. Anxiolytics do not help antidepressants. They actually slow down the functionality of antidepressants. Okay, thank you.